Welcome to Channel 18 News, I'm Jim Rogers. Silver Springs and Fort Worth Police, along with the Hopkins County Sheriff's Office, have released the name of the 34-year-old woman whose body was found on high, just off of Highway 67 West in Silver Springs. Rochelle Mims was murdered in Fort Worth and her body dumped on property inside the Silver Springs city limits Sunday. With a crime scene in two cities that are 100 miles apart, Silver Springs Chief of Police Jay Sanders said his department has been busy as they continue investigation into the murder. Silver Springs and Fort Worth Police are working together to sort out evidence from a crime scene in Fort Worth and the discovery of the body in Silver Springs. Lucius Newhouse III, age 54 of Fort Worth, was arrested at the scene for the murder. According to Silver Springs City Manager Mark Maxwell, the city awaits delivery of flashing lights for the Crosstown Trail Main Street crossing. The railroad crossing has been completed and the path on the north face of Coleman Lake Dam is near completion, awaiting the lights for the street crossing. The capital construction project that will replace 2,400 linear feet of aging sewer force main and 2,900 feet of gravity main that currently passes through the middle of the hospital complex is now 75% complete, according to Maxwell. Maxwell made his report Tuesday night to the Sulphur Springs City Council. The Sunset Street project will open bids for materials in September. The project will include new water mains, new sewer mains, and a new concrete street from Conley to Houston Street, a $275,000 grant, and a city funding of $132,000 will pay for the project. The street is often used by Sulphur Springs Independent School District buses now that the bus hub has been moved to the Prim Stadium visitors' parking lot. 166 potholes were repaired in the city and 28 water main ruptures have also been repaired, according to the city manager's report. For a look at the complete city manager's report for September's council meeting, go to kssdradio.com. In the city of Sulphur Springs, water rates will increase 2%. Sewer rates will increase 2% and sanitation rates will increase 2.25% following the unanimous vote of the Silver Springs City Council during their September 4th regular session. A budget amendment for fiscal year 2018 and appropriations for fiscal year 2018 through 2019, which include salary increases for two municipal judges and the city secretary, were approved with only one opposing vote on each of the two items. Atmos bills in the city will see an average $1.06 increase. The rate was, was reached in a negotiated settlement by the 170 cities, including Silver Springs, who are members of a steering committee that negotiate rates with Atmos. Council amended the capital improvement plan for 2019 through 2023 to include drainage issues in Pacific Park. The partial collapse of a storm drain that ran under the railroad track near Carter and MLK motivated the action. Flooding in the area made streets virtually impassable during heavy rains. The 470 feet of drainage from Carter to Lamar will reroute the runoff away from the railroad tracks and will cost $85,000. The cost will impact the summer paving program for the city. One paving project will be removed to fund the drainage. Currently, the city has 35 drainage problems, according to city manager Maxwell. Maxwell stated that it may be time to think about adding a drainage fee of $1 on water bills to fund drainage improvements. A charter review committee was appointed. City Councilman Jimmy Lucas, Mayor John Sellers, City Manager Maxwell, City Attorney Jim McElroy will serve with appointed members Tyler Law, Jay Julian, Thomas Harrison, Will Longineau, Dr. Scott McDermott, Larry Powers, Bill Watts, and Kayla Price Mitchell. The Economic Development Budget, the Economic Development Corporation budget for fiscal year 2019 will be $1,800,000 following approval by the council. Two zoning changes were approved by the council. 
property at 435 Conley will be rezoned single family attached. This will allow building attached housing units with yard space between the houses. The cost of the houses will be between $125,000 and $185,000. Property at 1332 South Hillcrest will be zoned light commercial, allowing the three acres near Rockdale Road to be used for office and retail space. The council also approved an update for service credits, which increases the value of employment retirement benefits. Melinda McDonald and her family were victims of a drunk driving crash in 2017 in Hopkins County. Now Melinda and her family are inviting you to come to the Mothers Against Drunk Driving Mad Walk on September 29th at Shannon Oaks. Let's find out more about their story. Beth, tell us what you do. Well, I am the program director for Mothers Against Drunk Driving in East Texas. We cover a 23 county area and we are um, really just trying to mainly get the message out to people that you know, if you're choosing to drink, that's your business, but it is everyone's business when you decide to drive okay. after you do that. So we just are trying to get people to make a plan and get to where they they don't drive when they've after they've been drinking. Well, when you see that MAD, M-A-D-D -D with the capital mm -hmm. letters, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which also takes in drugged driving as well. Correct. And we can talk more about that. We would also like to meet our other guest, Melinda McDonald. Good morning, Melinda. Good morning. Um, you are a victim of a drunk driving crash within Hopkins County. Yes. Okay. It happened December the 9th. Um, this past year, we were coming home from Hobby Lobby in Greenville. We were hit from behind. J just a family trip out shopping? Yeah, me and my daughter, uh, Callie, her boyfriend, Sayla, and my six-month-old granddaughter, Brooklyn, were in the car. And um, we were hit from behind. Uh, we didn't see her coming up behind us. We didn't see anything like that. Just checked all my mirrors. We were all clear. We were just driving, slowing down for construction. And when the hit happened, um, next thing I know, we were rolling. Um, when the car stopped, all I saw in the back was Brooklyn. I didn't see Callie or Sayla. They had been ejected from the car. So your daughter and her fiancé were ejected. Right. The baby was in the car seat. Yes. Me and the baby were in the car. I couldn't get out. Of course, the baby couldn't get out. So some good Samaritans, as you would call them, they came and helped us and got us out. And, of course, everything started from there. We were trying to find Callie. The lady came up and said they knew exactly where she was. It took us a little bit to find Sayla. He had actually hit his head on the concrete barrier, and I guess he was out. I don't know. He was he was alert when I spoke to him, when they found him. All he asked me was what happened. I was like, I don't know. All I know is we're hurt, and where's Callie? And, you know, we found her. I got everybody together. That was my main focus. Yes. I was the crazy woman trying to get her family together at least you know so and finding yourself on that roadside needing to call someone your husband had just taken yeah. a trip out of town and just landed in a yeah airport he, charlotte north carolina is where he had landed and my other daughter who was working um she had to call him and tell him what happened and it was the next day before he could make it here well and you found yourself split because you had to go to the hospital with your daughter who was badly injured mm -hmm. and the baby who had to go to somebody right. and you I mean just picture yourself in that type of frantic time mm -hmm. what I want to know also is what about that other driver um after everything was done we f we slowly started to find out you know more about what happened you know now we have Facebook and Messenger and all these things so we were able to find out a little bit about what happened um, the driver had been driving erratically from what we could tell, at least from Rockwall. Um, some people did try to call police. Oh. Yeah. And uh, I guess they were not able to find her or whatever. But we uh, found out later she was actually arrested. She had been arrested for DWI. Mm -hmm. um, was not her first time. Okay. So. Well, Beth, you got in the loop on this with mm -hmm. a phone call? Um, well, actually, our victim service advocate, Melissa Granberry, was the one who has been working mm -hmm. with the family um, and helping them try to walk through the judicial process and what's going to happen next, those kind of things. 
and then just even emotional support and trying to help them that way and so that's been the main way I actually met the McDonald's um, in court one day I came up to observe the trial and or not trial but the yeah. sentencing and uh, that's where I got to talking with them okay so that's how I got involved but we uh, were very very um, sorry about what has happened but one of the things and when we were talking about this interview I wanted to have Melinda here because she was so articulate during the sentencing phase with her victim impact statement and the things she had to say because she clearly has emotions about what happened but they're very clear about trying to make the situation better not being angry about what has happened but make the situation better and that's that's really what we want we want people who can get involved and make sure that the community understands what happens when a drunk driving incident or crash occurs and how it affects the family that night and then going forward and it affects the whole family not just the four of them that were in the vehicle um, and, and in a permanent mm -hmm. effect mm -hmm. um, let's go back to the crash and tell in brief terms that that your daughter did survive right everybody survived Callie had to have back surgery there was a period of time right after the accident she was had some paralysis but they decided on surgery she was up walking with a walker the next day <laughs> however there was um, you know some limitations for the first three or four months with her having a like an infant daughter she wasn't able to really care for her the way she wanted to or could do right. you know before so, and Sayla? Sayla, um, he had a brain bleed and a fractured skull. He was off work for a while, but everybody's pretty much back to normal. Okay. okay. So. The person who was driving mm -hmm. <clears throat> has been sentenced and is serving some time. Right. She was charged with three counts. Um, the judge only charged her with, well, wouldn't say charged her with one, sentenced her on one for five years depending on how well she does those five years will determine how she is sentenced for the other two years i'm hoping she does really well and gets help and you know will make a better life path for herself so that she can just get probation and come out and live her life and do well and hopefully this incident changing her life yes permanently as well for right. the better is this i have to ask you is this typical there's i know all kinds of incidents involving drunk driving mm -hmm. some fatalities and some injuries that is correct and if you look at the statistics for 2017 and statistics are usually way behind so you can't always find out recent statistics so 2017 just came out and within the listening area that you have there were 92 crashes and the reason we call them crashes and not accidents is it's not an accident to put your keys in the car and start it and drive away after you've been drinking or taking drugs that can impair your ability to drive. It's a crash. And so we want to make sure people understand that, that if you're going to do things like that, that's your business. If it's illegal, that's between you and the police. But it becomes the community's business when you put your key in the car and you make that decision to drive when you're impaired and it becomes our business because you're driving past us and families like the McDonald's that get caught up in it and that's really what we want the message for people to to understand is we we want to see that 92 crashes in this listening area go down to zero <laughs> that's what we want is zero I believe there were six fatalities as well and that does not count the injuries there were many more injuries from those 92 crashes whether it was the impaired driver in a single crash accident or whether it was people who were innocent and just driving along doing what they were supposed to it's still a big impact on our society and those people's families and so we're not trying to take away people's fun we're trying to make sure that people say stay safe and that there are fewer people like the mcdonald's fam mcdonald family that has to go through this in the in the future you send out and thank you for doing so over our most recent holiday labor day holiday you mm -hmm. know tips and reminders 
and maybe someone listening is not going to you know really have a problem with drinking and driving but someone in their family or someone mm -hmm. in their uh, circle um, they need a reminder mm -hmm. maybe they need someone to really be proactive and say hey look we would hate for something like this to ever ever happen in your life mm -hmm. Um, so those same rules with our holidays coming up would apply, you know, just Absolutely. find another way home if you find yourself in that situation. Well, there are several things that you can do, even as somebody who's a concerned family member. If you're planning a party at your home and you're going to have people there consuming alcohol, if you find if you see somebody who is who has been drinking more than they should, and it's very easy to get the understanding by body weight and how fast alcohol metabolizes is metabolizes out of your body from doing a quick search on the internet okay. but it, just from that perspective have if you see somebody have them stay at your house mm -hmm. let them spend the night take their keys from them find another family member to take them home the inconvenience of going back to get your car melinda and i were talking about this while we were waiting is much better than the inconvenience of totaling your car and hurting other people so much, so much so, mm -hmm. and it's just good sense. We have a major representation of all the sentiments that you are talking about this morning in our walk here in September. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the walk is actually organized by victims like Melinda from drunk driving crashes. Uh, we have two others that are on the committee, uh, Becky Hicks and Frankie Baker, and they are both driving forces behind putting this together, okay. both of which live in this area as well. So um, they asked to put this walk together and actually drive it, <clears throat> excuse me, and they um, have done the logistics for it. They're, they're doing a lot of it, but what they're trying to do is raise awareness in this community right. and bring people together to see that there are real faces and real families that are impacted in Sulphur Springs and in this entire listening area that are impacted by this. The walk is September 29th, and that yes. is a Saturday. It is a Saturday evening. Okay. It is a glow walk. Okay. And I would really like to encourage your listeners that there were 92 crashes in the 2017. I would like to see 92 people register to be walkers, to come out that night and actually raise funds to help us continue to be able to talk about this. This is going to be at Shannon Oaks Church, and it is mm -hmm. a lovely uh, mm -hmm. place out there mm -hmm. under the trees. And you walk for those who no longer can. That's right. And alongside those who are learning to walk again. Mm -hmm. And um, together ending drunk and drugged driving. And it's more than mm -hmm. moms. It's dads, too. Isn't that right? Oh, it's, yeah. it's whole families. <laughs> yeah. it, it is whole families. It the... was started by a mother okay. who had something like, who had a crash and lost a daughter. But really, it's a movement. Uh, we have one brochure that has a picture of a dad on it that says, <laughs> I became a mother and the day. He became a mother because he lost a child. So he is part of the family of, drunk, of mothers against drunk driving. And notice that it says driving. It's not mothers against drunk drivers. We're not against people. We're against the action. Okay. Here's Don Julian with sports. Sulphur Springs High School Assistant Principal Vanessa Abron announced the 10 homecoming nominees for this school year on Tuesday. The nominees are Joanna Duran, Maddie Millsap, Madison Clark, Madison Caprarada, Elena Bledzo, Madeline Ray, Jacqueline Espinoza Frias, Camry Price, Sadie Stroud, and Stephanie Olguin. The student body will be voting on the nominees and they will select a homecoming queen and two princesses. The queen and princesses will be announced after all the nominees are presented prior to the kickoff at the Wildcats homecoming game against Terrell on Friday, September 14th. Earlier that day, the nominees will be recognized at a pep rally in the main high school gym. The homecoming nominees will be entered by, or excuse me, interviewed by media members this Friday. And the nominees will have an early morning practice at the field in the multi-purpose building on Wednesday, September 12th. 
It'll be the Wildcats and the Lovejoy Leopards at Gerald Prim Stadium this Friday night. That's a rematch of a bi-district game from last November. At his weekly media gathering Wednesday morning, Wildcats football coach Greg Owens discussed the Wildcats and the Leopards. Yeah, I was hoping they were going to be a little down, is what I was hoping. <laughs> um, but from last year's playoff deal, you know, the D1 kid and the bumper pool kid and uh, receiver, and it seemed like it was one more in my mind, but uh, but they're good. I mean, they're stinking good. They got to run the running backs back and quarterbacks back. They got two really good receivers, 28's the running back. I mean, he's 210 on our deal. He looks 220 on the video. Mm. But I mean, he is a load and he's coming downhill. So we got to make him move laterally. And, and gang tackle him and go get after him. The quarterback is just savvy and smart and experienced, can spin it, you know, those kind of things. Um, and then two receivers that are really good possession kind of receivers that make plays and sure handed 21 and five. Those guys scare me. 21 plays a lot of defense, two at corner, mm-hmm. savvy kids. I mean, they're a lot like us, to be honest with you, because they're th- they got 31 seniors, mm-hmm. you know, so they're, they're a heavy senior team too. He's carrying about 70 on his roster, and, wow. and there's 10 sophomores there, too, that are also playing. Uh, so he, he's, he's got a big group, you know, and, and a pretty explosive group, too. Defensively, um, they junk it up. I mean, up front, they're big. I mean, go back to offense. They're offensive linemen. Uh, they got a couple of them that are really nasty. Hmm. Uh, one of them's a sophomore center, and there's also a senior that plays there quite a bit. Uh, there's a tackle out there that's really nasty. So that they do a great job and know what they're doing, and have done a w- really well executing uh, thus far on the scrimmage and the and the ball game we've seen of them. Um, you know, defensively they junk it up, and what I mean by all that is that they're going to be basically a four-two-five look, an even look up front, but a lot of movement. I mean, they're just bringing guys from here, there, just trying to mess with you, trying to get you to simplify your blocking schemes and pass protection, uh, all that stuff. So, you know, that, that that's a challenge up there for our linemen. You know, now they, they got some two big two techniques too. One's 285, one's 330. I mean, mm-hmm. there's some big fellas inside, and their defensive ends are smaller guys, but extremely active and moving around. So right now those are the guys that give us the most fits and secondary very sound very very smart very savvy they know who they're covering you know they may get out manned every now and then but they're going to be where they're supposed to be they don't blow coverages uh, that kind of stuff so very smart and savvy group they got a really strong kicker they can put it in the end zone great on field goals just very confident in his kicking so uh, they're a well-rounded ball club again this year mm-hmm. and uh, just just hats off to those guys and what they're doing and, and so it, it'll definitely be a, a heck of a matchup for us they had a linebacker name i think broughton or something like that i think he's an outside linebacker uh, matt like the middle linebacker he, he commented on him yep. but this broughton was named the uh, like defensive player of the week or for that yeah. game. That yeah. Well I, well, I can't tell you names. I guess I could if I look on the scout report, but I'm really more on numbers. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's one of their linebackers. I saw him on there somewhere. Yeah, there's a Hunter Broughton. Yeah, 32. He, yeah. He's pretty active. Yeah, he is. He's, he's an active kiddo. Uh, does a good job for them, too. In, inside guy, too. He, he's a physical inside run guy that's going to bring our linemen to sink their hips and go get after him. Mm-hmm. He'll, come, he'll come and get after their tail, too. So, uh, But those good. I, I, I've just been more impressed with the front four. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that, that's where my eyes have been this whole week, studying yeah. video on those guys, because uh, we got to deal with those first before we can get that second level. Uh, but, again, the big guys inside and, again, the athletic quick guys at the ends, those are the guys that have stolen my attention. Uh, doing that, and then it's, everybody else has just been solid. Linebackers have been where they're supposed to be, and you know that kind of stuff. Secondary is doing what they're supposed to do. So uh, I'm, I'm just more concerned about us getting that front, those front guys blocked first, and uh, th- those are the ones that have drawn my attention. When I think about Todd Ford. I think about offense. I think he was part of like Todd Dodge. I yeah, think kind of. He and Dodge, and uh, oh, I've lost the name now. The offensive coordinator. Uh, that's there right now. He's done a great job too, and they, they've been together. And they've both been with Todd and and uh, done all that stuff. And so that, they they know what they're doing. I mean, they they're very sound and they're great to deal with as human beings too. I'm just good guys, and uh, they they put out some good football teams. The Lady Cats volleyball team defeated a very good Wills Point team three to nothing in Wildcat Gym Tuesday night. Both teams are ranked in the Texas Girls Coaches Association poll. The key for the Lady Cats was strong finishes in each set. And after the match, I talked with Lady Cats volleyball coach Justin Manus. 
closed out matches very good tonight. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't think we started sets very well, but it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And so uh, if we can just get that consistency all the way through, a, you know, a set, you know, I, I think it would have looked a lot different for us. I mean, we, we won in three, but, uh, you know, we have some areas that we need to work on, you know, just, just coming in and, and treating, treating every team like they're, uh, you know, just, just number one in the state is, is what we need to do. Yeah, you look very like you weren't very happy when we got behind six to nothing in that set third. Set. Yeah, I don't know many coaches that would be happy about being behind <laughs> six. So especially, you know, that team's ranked 11th in the state in 4A, yeah. and, and they're ranked for a reason. They're a scrappy team. They don't let a lot hit, hit the ground. I mean, they're going to pick a lot of stuff up, and uh, you know, we just have to learn to stay in system. And they were getting us out of system with quick balls over the net. We weren't able to set up our offense and run it because of what they were doing. So. Uh, I mean, I'm not taking away from them. They're, they're a good team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've been pondering this for a couple of weeks. Is it possible that Autumn Tanton could be getting better? She is getting better. Getting her, better. Uh, you know, and I said it last year at the beginning of the season, her volleyball IQ is way up there. Uh, she, she can just read things so quick in the middle of a match to make, to score when we need it. And, and, and that's just her really studying the game. And so she's gotten better as we progress. I mean, she put up she put up 10, 10 kills tonight, and a few of those were big big time, big time. Ga game changers for us. And you know, I, I credit a lot of that to Lexi kind of getting on the same page with her yes. to give that up to ball to her in the wheelhouse. Oh yeah, you know, and our, our, our pass has got to be on point for that to happen. And so it starts with the pass, but Lexi did deliver the ball well. Uh, I thought we had some people step in and, 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 and play well. And I thought Kate Womack did a really, really good job. Mm -hmm. uh, got us a couple of aces and, uh, uh, you know, definitely attacked the ball well. So, you know, it, it got some people some experience and uh, it, it's something we can build off of, but we can continue getting better. I thought uh, Sydney Washburn had a very, very good game. Yeah, One no, of the best I've seen. Yeah, no, she, she had some big time shots when we, when we needed it. Uh, she played the net very aggressive. Uh, you know, a lot of things were being popped back over real quick. And so she was able to start reading that and uh, she did a good job. Uh, will there be any emotion when we play Wiley East on Friday? You this know, is a team that I, yeah. shocked us in yes. the playoffs. Uh, you know, I'm hoping the ones that played last year will will, will be ready to play. You know, it's a you know it's a, it's a team that beat us last year, and it was it was shocking for us. Shocking. So uh, we just got to show up and play. They're going to be a tough team. I mean, they're going to be similar to a Will's Point, so we got to play. Now they had a losing record when we played them last year, but they may be, you know, much improved. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't haven't seen any records. Or you know, it just depends on who they've been playing. They may have been playing some really, really tough competition. So, uh, uh, well, that's I'm, a rugged district. No, oh, it is. You're it get is. Two you know, losses against a lot of Thornies and some other teams. Like you know, that. I'm not going to take anything away from them. We're going to go over and, and treat them like they're an un unbelievable team, and we're going to try to play the best we can. The Saltillo Lady Lions cross country team competed at a meet in Avery last Thursday and Cyanna Collins took first place again. Other Lady Lions and their finishes included uh, Reagan Spear in 18th place, Christina Wade in 42nd place, Ophelia Cabrera in 67th place, and Chandler Bain in 90th place. The Lady Lions JV took first place in the meet, and the junior high team placed third. The Lady Lions will compete next at the 22nd annual Tim Minky Invitational Cross Country Meet in North Hopkins on Thursday. Thanks for watching Channel 18 News. Have a great evening. Again, this has been a great week. This has been a tremendous week, really, mental focus of guys. I mean, they really seem to understand the game plan and what we're doing, and they're asking questions, and they're making adjustments. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about that, and I hope, I think that comes from a little maturity and them understanding the importance of that. And, and uh, so, so it's, it's been good, both sides of the ball, guys understanding what, what the plan is this week and, and executing. So we have a, a few, a few here and there going, going both ways. Oh, yeah. and both, both oh, yeah. Just gonna be part How of. How was up for us? Uh, I know, I know it was we were okay. Long. I mean, there, there was a lot of factors last week. We had a lot of cramping. We had probably four or five kids cramping, but kids were going both ways too. There's a lot of reasons for that. So we're trying to evaluate that stuff. And you say we'll drink more water. Well, they're drinking water, you know. But but the problem is, it was really hot. If you're on turf. Um, you know, it's the first ball game, so this is you. Game shape is different just going through a practice. I mean, you're out there for the 48 minutes. You know, we and again we're playing these guys both ways. 
So in some of it, maybe in not enough water in some situations. Some of it was also them not had the proper nutrition. So we've addressed all those things this week and continue to hammer that and, and uh, you know, we'll just continue to work on that stuff. But some of it, and it should, some of it would just be pure conditioning too a little bit. So what's the answer to that? All, all in the above. And, it, and it's in, for each individual kid, it might be a little bit different. One kid I'm talking to is a coach, I ain't been eating enough. Well, there's his answer. And another kid, I mean, I'm a little out of shape. Right here. Another one, I'm, I'm hot. So, again, the body all for every kid's a little bit different. So, can't say as a whole what, exactly what that is, but we are very aware of it and, and we're working on addressing the issues. Last, uh, last two minutes before the district starts, it's off already, I'm baby. I'm telling you, it's, 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 you, you better get your stuff straight because here it goes. I mean, yeah, we start district district play the next week with Terrell, so it's kind of nice to have two home games here in a row, and uh, we're, we're kind of excited about that. Uh, but we got to worry about these guys right now, and if you will, a tune-up or whatever, or figure it out, or uh, because but we're all in the same boat. Everybody in the district's in the same boat, so uh, you know, you got to just do what you got to do.